Hello, everyone. Welcome to Coffee with Kalefi. We're switching over to the PowerPoint here. So today I am uh, going to be joined by two guest presenters. So I'm going to go through their introductions in a second. So the topic today is designing heat pump systems for commercial water heaters. And I'll go through kind of the intro slides here and then we'll get started. So if you're having trouble with audio, usually the best case is to just log out and log back in. Uh, if you do want to try a phone number, that's the tech support directly to go to webinar. A couple common questions that we get. Uh, would you like a copy of the presentation? Uh, just hit yes in the post webinar survey and we'll send you a PDF of that. And then we'll also have this whole webinar up on YouTube uh, in a few days. So if you can't stay for the whole thing or want to catch it later, we'll have it up there for you. Okay, if your state or your jurisdiction takes uh, this type of certificate that tells you what the agenda was and how many hours uh, on the class, we'll have those available for you as well after uh, the webinar is over. So one of the things that uh, ties into this webinar a little bit today is that uh, for the AHR uh, 2022 Innovation Awards, uh, we were one of the top three finalists for a DHW control system uh, with our Legio mix valve, our thermosetter, and our sink mixer uh, that I think really plays well into what we'll be talking about with uh, just the best of the best for DHW research, regardless of what's uh, heating the water in your mechanical room. The current issue of hydronics, number 30, is hydronics for low energy and net zero buildings. And then right around the corner, we're going to have uh, another one for a plumbing topic that'll be pressure reducing valves. So we'll have some more information about that. Uh, look for that in the summer. And there's also a digital version, which is really cool because sometimes there'll be additional resources like videos and links that you can click through instead of just a, a static PDF, which we also have. And then next month, we have another manufacturer who's going to help us out with a presentation, uh, Proven Plumbing Systems with Becky Henderson from Grunfoss. So this is a series of courses that we just started this year that we've been doing in person in a couple locations. And we're going to have Becky join us to do a virtual version of that just in case we're not on tour in a, a town near you yet, but uh, we're kind of figuring out what the rest of the locations will be for that series in person going forward. But if, uh, if you can't make it, we'll have two virtual options for you as webinars throughout the year. And then today I am joined by uh, Jennifer and she is the, uh, Jennifer Russell is the segment development manager for decarbonization at Lock and Bar, where she leads the company's commercial decarbonization efforts. For more than 11 years, she's helped develop Lock and Bar's highest efficiency products with a specialized focus on heat pump water heaters. So hello, Jennifer. And then uh, Dan began his career in the residential HVAC industry, steadily gaining uh, over 10 years of field experience before taking a desk job <laughs> to provide technical support for Lock and Bar's commercial products. Dan is now the product manager for commercial water heaters, which includes uh, heat pump water heater duties as well. So welcome, Dan and Jennifer. Um, I've known Dan for a long time. I used to be a manufacturer's rep uh, for Lock and Bar in a, a previous role. And then I know Jennifer through a group called the Advanced Water Heater Initiative, which is a, a group of industry uh, leaders trying to figure out uh, a way forward for heat pump water heaters. So we've got a great team to lead us through the, the presentations today. So I think that we will uh, have the, the group toggle off our videos and then we'll do the slides and bring everybody back for a Q&A at the end. So to start with, I'm going to go to the next slide here and have a poll for everybody. So let me get this launched. So we wanna gauge the audience and see, let's see if this launches. We wanted to gauge kind of a comfort level with heat pump water heaters. Give that a second to load. It's spinning a little bit on my side. Okay. So if, let's say today, you were required by somebody, uh, by the state or the you know federal government or whoever, and you just had to use heat pump water heaters in all your projects, 100% moving forward, uh, is that something that you would be comfortable with? Uh, or is that something that makes you nervous? So the, the question is, if that makes you nervous, uh, answer yes there. We'll give that a few seconds and then we'll close it down and see kind of where we where we sit as of right now. So it's coming in. Uh, I'm going to go ahead and close this. So 58 
percent of you said yes that would make you nervous so honestly i think that that's probably uh that's a higher percentage than i would have expected seeing as this uh this technology i feel like has been in the news more recently in the last couple of years but i think that that's good that the comfort level is is higher uh with the um the nose than i would have expected so what do you think uh Dan and Jennifer, is that kind of what you were anticipating there? Yeah, I'd say that's probably in line with uh, kind of what we were thinking. Great. Okay. Well, just wanted to kind of see who on the call today, uh, what they thought. So why don't I turn it over to you guys, and then I'll jump in with a couple questions if I see anything come through the chat, and then we'll take some of the questions that are uh, typed in at the end. So uh, take it away. Okay. Well, I hope we can help with some of the um, the nervousness here because we're going to go through several topics that um, should help us all understand heat pump uh, system design a bit better, including uh, mechanical room, place, and space, um, the cost of increased electrical capacity, uh, trade-off between more storage versus more heat pump, uh, the different factors in sizing the tank versus the heat pump, and then Dan's going to take us through some uh, retrofit projects, and um, that's definitely an inter interesting uh, one to go through. And then we're going to talk about backup heaters um, and when that backup heat source is necessary. So if you want to flip to the video, um, I'm going to cover some terminology first. Okay, I'll get that loaded up here. Okay. Just a second. Okay. All right, so what we're showing here is actually a video of a single pass system. So single pass is, is a term that uh, we'll talk about a little bit through this presentation. And what you're seeing here is the heat pump charging the tanks in a single pass system. Um, so this would be happening, let's say it's a multifamily application. This is your 3 a.m. Uh, the tanks have been depleted through use um, throughout the day. And now the heat pump is simply taking that cold water and reheating, re recharging those tanks. Okay, next video here, we're gonna see it discharging the tank. All right, you see hot water flowing out of the tank there, um, headed out to the system, and now obviously the cold water is refilling the tank. Now by this point, the heat pumps would actually be um, turned on. They would be charging the tank while uh, the system was making the straw. But this video is really just to show you uh, how this water is gonna flow through these tanks. And so, um, I guess the key to this is you're seeing a stratification layer travel through. Um, and so that's that's kind of the key point of the single pass system there is a stratified tank. We've got one last video to show you. Right, so same, same single pass system, uh, but now you're gonna see a little more what you would expect. So you've got a draw on the system, so hot water is gonna be leaving the tank. Uh, but at the same time, these, this heat pump, you know, sees that the, the hot water is leaving the system, so it's going to turn on, and the heat pump is going to be providing hot water um, at the same time. And so this is um, this is what you would be seeing if, if you had a large straw uh, and the heat pumps were triggered to come on, you'd be pulling from the tank and the heat pump together. Um, so the key there for, for the single pass system is that you're, you're heating the water to the set point in a single pass through that heat exchanger inside the heat pump. And I think, Jennifer, when, when people first hear this co concept, right, that's a concept that's kind of confusing, new to everybody. So this is kind of even uh, for us when we brought on our line, it was really kind of the learning process of how these single pass systems work. So right. uh, it's just been a learning process for everybody um, on how these are piped, how they function. So definitely don't expect anybody to be an expert after watching that, but it's, <laughs> but it, it it, it's yeah, it, it helps. And it, that's what we're trying to do is just set the stage, but definitely has been probably one of the biggest things internally for us as we brought these the heat pumps on and, and started to educate everybody. All right, so the, the next thing I wanna talk about uh, as far as terminology goes is a swing tank. So in this piping diagram here, you'll see a single pass system like we just saw. So you've got the, the heat pumps heating that water to the set point. Um, one, one pass through the heat exchanger and then into the storage tank. 
Um, but in addition to that, you've got a you've got an electric tank that's handling the recirc load for the building. And so the reason you want to do this is this is really kind of isolating that recirc from your thermal storage. Um, so you're not going to interrupt that stratification that you have inside of those tanks with the heat pumps. All right. If you want to go to the next one, we'll cover one more terminology piece here, and this is multi-pass. So this one should look familiar. Um, in this scenario, you've got the heat pump water heater um, plumbed in just like force circulation heaters are plumbed in today. Um, so the multi-pass situation, you're going to use multiple passes through the heat pump heat exchanger to get that water up to set point. Um, you're not doing that in a single pass like the, the first diagram that we went through. So like I said, this one, this one should look pretty familiar to everyone. And on this one, um, it makes sense to bring that building recirc load back to your tank because you're this, you know, this tank isn't uh, maintaining that real tight stratification layer like the single pass system. And Jennifer, this was a question that we had uh, pre-submitted to. Do you want to cover some of the additional pros and cons of a, a multi-pass versus a single pass? Yeah, sure. So again, like I just mentioned, the, the multi-pass is probably more familiar because it's been used with forced circulation gas water heaters for quite some time now. Um, it is really a great choice for heat pump retrofit. So if you are pulling out um, an older gas water heater and you want to put a heat pump system in its place, um, there's a couple benefits here. One is you could just leave the piping the way it is. Um, that that multi-pass piping will be just fine with your heat pump water heater, and you can even leave the tanks if they're in good shape. So for a retrofit situation, um, multi-pass is definitely a winner there. And single pass is a great option, especially for new construction. Um, and the reason is because it lends itself to demand response capabilities. Uh, demand response programs are, are fairly new, uh, but they're essentially using the tanks and a hot water system as a large thermal battery um, so that they can shift the, the electrical load during times of high stress on the electrical grid. So even if um, it's not something that's required in your area now, a single pass is still a great option for new construction because as these programs do come uh, on board and become more and more important because we're increasing uh, the use of electric products to be prepared for, for the future. And that's, that, I guess, would also set you up if you have different rates throughout the day and wanted to uh, heat water with a, a lower kilowatt per hour uh, rate, you could be in good shape for that too, right? Absolutely. Yeah, I, I wasn't going to go into too much detail on the demand response, but uh, you, you hit it right on the head, Max. I mean, there's okay. it's more than go. just... We can save um, that for the... Yeah, we, we may have yeah. a whole other webinar for that. <laughs> there we go. <laughs> okay, I'll switch okay, so, to your first project if that's uh, if you're ready. Yep, yep. Now that we've covered okay. that terminology, so we're all on the same page. Um, let's let's go through a couple of projects, and I'll go ahead and tell you, uh, I'm taking the easy stuff here. So Dan Dan's gonna he's gonna do all the hard. Yeah, Max. I thought we were friends. You're giving me the hard stuff and her the easy stuff. We're we'll have to talk about that later. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so what we wanna lay out here is a couple of projects. Uh, our first project is a multifamily application. So it's got uh, 43 bedroom apartments, uh, 42 bedrooms and 21 bedroom apartments. Um, this is located in San Francisco and the design temperature is 35 degrees Fahrenheit. Now we're gonna consider for this particular application, a system design that's using uh, heat pumps with the refrigerant R513A. So R513A is a low GWP replacement for R134A, which is which is a bit more common right now. Um, the properties of the refrigerant are important to consider because they will affect the the low ambient operation temperature that you can get to. So essentially, how you know how cold can it be outside before your heat pump um, drops off too far in capacity or simply can't run anymore? Uh, and then also the refrigerant's gonna impact what water temperature you're able to get out of the heat pump. So those, uh, those are important to consider, obviously, when you're designing uh, your system. All right, so for project A, if you wanna flip to the next slide, um, we, we run this scenario through um, sizing calculator. We come up with a need for four 185,000 BTU air source heat pumps and 2,300 gallons of storage. All right, so this initial sizing is optimized around cost and recovery. 
Um, and uh, we're making that assumption there that there's some adjustments that could be made. But at this point, if it's a brand new project, new construction, um, then hopefully, you know, the design is still open. And so footprint can be manipulated to, to fit the system in. Uh, you could look at optimizing cost a bit further by increasing the amount of storage and decreasing the size of the heat pumps. Um, but that's going to cost you some recovery time. And, and if you wanted to do that, you really have to take a deep dive on the load profile to be sure that um, the sizing really meets the need for the application. You've got to have enough off-peak time to refill those tanks, uh, especially if you're downsizing your heat pump. All right, so um, with that, if you want to flip to the next slide there. Again, I, as I said, this is kind of best case is if you've got a, a blank sheet of paper and you're designing all this on the front end, um, you could you know, hopefully have unlimited mechanical room space or mechanical yard or roof. It, it would be kind of an open option at that point. Um, in this particular scenario, considering you're in San Francisco and it's a you know, pretty fair climate there, the best scenario is probably to put the heat pumps and the tanks outdoors. That would save you, you know, valuable footprint inside of the building. Um, and then it also it would allow you a little more leeway on, on noise levels, because that's really important consideration for these heat pump systems. These are going to be uh, louder when they're operating than the traditional uh, gas combustion water heater would have been. Yeah, Jeff, I think it's, that's, that's a big point there, because that's one thing we hear from our customers, right? Well, my gas appliance wasn't that loud. Well, Obviously, we're talking about a different piece of equipment. Yeah. And so it, it just that those kind of comments, you know, something we hear pretty common because you think what well, we're pushing about 9,000 CFMs with some of these fans and good amount of air velocity yeah. coming off of them. Between the uh, the compressor and and the amount of air that you're moving with these pieces of equipment, it's it's a big difference. Um, outside of the noise level and the, you know the location for the system, you also got to consider the electrical needs. And again, since I took the easy one here, um, hopefully it's a blank sheet of paper and you can design that um, electrical in on the front end, and you know you're not having to go through um, upgrades and things like you would on a retrofit. And then last case here, you know, budget is probably never a blank sheet of paper, right? <laughs> Somebody's always got to pay for the system, and nobody. Uh, Nobody wants to pay more than they have to. So again, that kind of comes back to if you've got some budget, if you do have some budget restraints, um, then you can consider, you know, adjusting that heat pump versus storage size. And hopefully, like I said, you, you've still got some opportunities on the design side uh, to, to adjust the footprint to fit the, the system that works in the budget the best. So with that, um, Dan's going to talk to you a little bit about, oh, sorry, I missed a slide there, <laughs> the piping diagram. Um, the, the layout of this particular system would be, um, you know, single pass, just like we looked at earlier. So you've got multiple heat pumps and multiple tanks. Uh, and again, this, the heat pumps are taking the, the cold city water, heating it up to the set point in a single pass and then um, moving that over into the storage tank, which maintains a, a stratified layer so that the, the hot water stays on the top, cold water's at the bottom. Um, and so it, your, um, your system design is fairly straightforward in this particular scenario um, with the ambient temperatures being what they are, 35 degrees, and, and you're kind of having a blank sheet of paper on the design. And then Max, I think you, you wanted to hit on some uh, some balancing options for the research line, right? Yep, and this is something that in other webinars that we've put together in you know one hour and then five minute increments, we talk about the differences in the mixing valves that you would use for these systems. And it doesn't really matter what the source is, uh, but if you are selecting a mixing valve with 100% hot port close off capability, so examples of these in our catalog, would be the electronic mixing valve, the Legio mix, and then also our angle mix valve. Uh, you can really simplify some of the piping. You don't need to balance with a globe valve what comes back to the, the cold port of the mixing valve because you can turn the hot off 100%. Uh, if you don't, um, an unbalanced system with a, just a regular thermostatic mixing valve that doesn't have the option to close that hot port 100%, uh, you can have what's called recirculation temperature creep. So what that would mean is that you know, three in the morning, if the first person in a commercial building to turn on uh, a faucet uh, may just get a really short blast of a, a temperature that's warmer than what you had set your mixing valve to, 
And it's because the, the hot water that's leaving uh, isn't being, you know, there's no load at three in the morning. So it's coming back. And if it's more than the, you know, if you're not losing as much heat to the heat loss of the recirc line running throughout the building, you can end up with warm water on both sides of the mixing valve, essentially. Uh, and it's something that we can fix with a globe valve to balance it. There's a little bit more work to commission that uh, versus the electronic uh, or the an the angle mix that we show on the left side of the, the slide. Um, there's not that additional step to commission. So both options are fine. Uh, this isn't product specific. That's just something to mention there um, because one of the you know, bigger picture things is, is whatever Lock and Bar is providing from the heat pump, we want to make sure that we're delivering that uh, as energy efficient uh, and as safely as possible. And those are, are two ways to do it. All right, so now we're going to talk about retrofit. So I think, you know, this is where just even with current, you know, high efficiency gas products, probably we have some of our biggest issues as far as installing contractors, uh, design engineers. Um, you know, we could have put a pull up a pull up for this and said, hey, what's your number one issue on a retrofit? But I think everybody on the call is probably going to say venting, right? So if I'm looking at a gas system and looking to see how I'm going to replace that, uh, you know, standard, you know, we'll say 80% uh, water heater now with, with the high efficiency, you know, we're all struggling on how we're going to run that vent, you know, am I able to get it within the vent length of the manufacturer? Um, you know, how many nineties do I have? So that's, that, that, that struggles real every day, real, everybody knows, understands that today. So uh, I can't say, well, you know, these heat pumps are going to alleviate that issue for you. You, you don't have to worry about venting, um, but some other things we're going to have to evaluate is, you know, storage. Uh, so when you look at, how much room do you need for storage? Because typically with the heat pumps, if you're doing a system, you're sizing it, you're going to have more storage than you typically would with the gas appliance. Um, Jennifer kind of talked about in her, you know, example, it was a it was a good balance between cost and recovery. You know, that may not always be the case. You know, the cost may come into play where you're going to have to try to get more storage. Um, you know, do you have room for that storage? Something you have to look at. Um, you know, if not, then we're going to have to go with more heat pumps, which is going to obviously be more you know, higher upfront cost for that job. Uh, and, and then the electrical. So that's, the electrical is going to be a big topic as we move forward with, with implementing these heat pumps. Uh, for years, you know, we've ran, you know, even a million BTUs off of, you know, a circuit less than 15 amps, 120 volts. Uh, now we're talking 208, 240, you know, 480, up to 100 amps on some some models, even more depending on them. So that that's, a major change to what's needed for the electrical. So you got to start looking at, well, do I even have that electrical infrastructure in the building? If not, you know, does my budget include to have that ran? And then after that, you got to look, okay, well, just because I have it in the building, can can the electrical company actually supply that to me? Is that able to be supplied from the street level? So those things have to be evaluated because then there could be a whole, you know, line upgrade coming into that area where that building is, if, you know, so these are things that are really going to have to be evaluated because say maybe the building you're working on is going through a retrofit and I want to go heat pumps. But then, you know, there's another new or a retrofit location going on down the block. Well, if we're, we're running off that same main feed. I mean, we could put, be putting a major increased capacity demand on that electrical infrastructure coming from the city, coming from the power company. So the, all that's going to have to be evaluated and, and could drive up the, up the install costs. Um, and then also, you know, is gas is gas still an option? You know, what's the goal of the project? Are we trying to, you know, lower our carbon footprint? Um, you know, have zero carbon footprint on site at this location? Um, so we really got to understand that when we're looking at that. You know, so if you're doing a uh, retrofit and there's some good gas equipment in there still, you know, do we keep that in there or does it have to be removed? So these are all kind of questions we're going to have to go through as we look at these retrofit, um, how we want to how we want to go about that. So when we look at this job, kind of what we'll look at is, if you want to go ahead to the next slide there, Max, is um, we pretty much determine that we've got limited electrical infrastructure, you know, and the cost does not allow us to install more uh, larger infrastructure. Power company won't bring in more um, either time or resources, you know, it's just not going to happen. So some things we look at is, well, we could try put these units indoors and we could try to keep that indoor temperature at a 
a fair ambient temperature. So in this sizing example, we went with uh, 65 to try to keep that room at. So what that allowed us to do is now we can apply three 185,000 BTU air source heat pumps, put those inside, and then we'll need 2,300 gallons of storage. That storage could stay inside, uh, it could go outside, but the heat pumps are going to have to stay inside to keep that ambient air around it at that temperature. Now, how do we keep that ambient air? You know, at, at 65 is, is also a challenge. You know, are we going to, uh, we're going to have to preheat some air, bring it into that space. So now we have to say, okay, how are we going to do that? Are we going to do that with the existing heating equipment in the building? Are we going to have to add some kind of electrical resistive heat in the ductwork and push that in? So that's a whole design consideration that has to be uh, brought into the uh, design of this. And then also, you know, these heat pumps are putting off cool air as they run. So if you're bringing 65, you could be leaving at 40, 45, you know, so we, you know, that cool air, if, if it isn't heated up, that's what's going to happen is that ambient air is going to drop down. Um, so we could do a couple of things, right? We can bring in that, that hot air, like we talked about, either some kind of resistive heat in the duct work, or we can just duck in if it's, if it's a gas appliance in the building or whatever they're using to heat that space, we can add additional duct work to heat that room. Um, or, you know, we could also look at ventilating, like we could push some of that cold air outside, maybe duct, duct, add duct work to the fan section of this, blow that cold air out, but we still have to bring some kind of fresh air into that room because that room's going to become into a negative, as we, negative pressure as we discharge that air. So, again, all considerations, but that's how we'd have to go about something like this is try to um, get a situation where we know we can get these units to perform. So if we have limited electrical, we couldn't satisfy the load like Jennifer could in her first example, we're gonna have to kind of tweak some things and do some things a little bit different. And that was the best way we found to do this one with, with the current conditions of, of no, limited electrical infrastructure. That, that's where it really gets tough on these retrofits, right? Is, is, is trying to uh, you know, balance this energy here. Now you've, you've got cooling off of the heat pumps. And so how are you gonna keep that indoor ambient temperature up? and um, you know, it, it's retrofits are certainly much, much more complicated and you don't want to use more more energy than you need to to make the system work. Yeah, I you know, had some conversations with some design build uh, companies and like they said, you know, when it comes to retrofit, there's there, those jobs are so involved that they prefer not to do those. Right. If it's new construction, they want to jump on that. They feel comfortable with applying the heat pump technology. But when it comes to you know, the retrofit, it just becomes kind of overwhelming for them at this point and, you know, what, what yeah. they're trying to do. So, you know, hopefully we can, as an industry, we can try to make them feel more comfortable you know, right. with the retrofits. I think we're good there, Max, if you want to move on. Okay. So one of the things that I wanted to mix in here is that whatever we're using to heat the hot water in the mechanical room, worst case scenario is that we're just dissipating heat from those tanks into the building unnecessarily all day long. So we want to keep as much of that hot water in those tanks as possible without um, really slowing down the response time for somebody to open a, a fixture for the wait time for hot water. So if somebody has to wait for seven minutes to get hot water, uh, we don't want that. But at the same time, there are no bonus points for overdoing it. So with the thermosetter, this is a great match for a balancing valve for DHW research systems because they're going to start to close down as soon as their individual risers are up to temperature. And then in this case, let's say it's both are up to temperature, it's gonna go down to a minimum CV of a 0.23 CV. So we're really just letting a little bit of water trickle through the building to make sure that we're up to temperature. As they cool down, they'll open up more. But what that does is it keeps that, that hot water kind of uh, in the nice warm jacket down in the mechanical room instead of uh, you know spinning wildly throughout the building because the last thing we want to do is put in a nice uh, heat pump water heater system and basically idle it because we're losing the heat loss of the recirc is is basically forcing it to run all day long we don't need that so uh, those are a couple things uh, heat pumps may be slower to recover uh, and we don't want uh, we don't want to dissipate that nice warm tank all day unless somebody needs it, and then we want to have a quick response time. So that thermosetter kind of uh, balances those those two objectives. All right, so let's let's talk about a uh, another project, but this time in a in a colder ambient climate. So 
we're going to consider the exact same building as we did with the first project that was in San Francisco. So 43 bedroom apartments, 42 bedroom apartments, and 21 bedroom apartments. Again, located in Boston and a negative five degree uh, Fahrenheit design temperature. So obviously some, some different considerations uh, with that type of ambient temperature. So Max, if you flip it to the next slide, if we were to put this um, through our sizing calculator, then what we would come back with is four 250,000 BTU air source heat pumps. Um, same refrigerant, mind you, this R513A, uh, but on that previous project, we only we had four, we had 485,000 BTU heat pumps. So got more um, larger heat pumps here. And then you've also got the 2,300 gallons of storage. And then in addition to that, you're now gonna need backup because um, anything below 35 degree ambient is gonna require either gas or um, electric backup uh, to give you the heat that you need in the system. All right, if you're gonna flip to the next slide here. All right, again, I'm, I'm considering kind of best case. I'm, I'm new design, right? So <laughs> I'm, I'm hoping we've got uh, the opportunity to design in um, plenty of mechanical room space, mechanical yard, wherever it is that these are going, um, that we can accommodate the footprint. And then another thing we could consider here as we did in the, the previous project was, could we put the heat pumps inside? Um, so like Dan talked about on that retrofit, you know, it's really, it's tough on those retros to figure out how you dissipate or take care of the cooling that those heat pumps um, provide as well. And so hopefully you've got, you know, a room that needs the cooling and then that's your best case scenario, right? You're not having to add any energy. Um, but what we could consider potentially is maybe a parking garage. Um, that would actually give you an opportunity to see a little bit warmer ambient temperatures. Um, and potentially, depending on the application, maybe it's going to eliminate the need for the backup. Depends on how the, the temperatures um, are in that parking garage. And Jennifer, that parking garage probably keeps you above those, maybe possibly those freezing temperatures. Right. Where you can worry about doing some kind of freeze protection with the heat pump. I mean, yeah, and that's a big consideration yeah. too. Um, the other, you know, consideration you want to have there is, do you just go ahead and design in the backup system? Uh, you know, and I think this is really going to come down to the building owner and what they prefer because if they prefer to to take up that space inside the parking garage and um, and have a heat pump only system, then you know that that's up to them. It's, they just have to consider that footprint. Uh, another building owner may prefer that they use that uh, that footprint for for other uses. They may find it more valuable otherwise. And in that case, you got to consider if you if you still want to maintain an electric system, um, you know, the electrical design for the building will have to accommodate that full electrical backup. So when you, when you talk about a uh, resistance electric heater, uh, the electrical load for the building is going to change quite a bit versus a heat pump only system. Um, the other thing too, I guess I want to point out about if you do go with the parking garage option is you, you could consider some maintenance, um, not really concerns, but you know, your preventive maintenance would have to be uh, planned on the front end because you may have dust or other particles um, that could happen in a, a parking garage, clogging up your evaporator, causing some issues like that. Um, yeah, so on that, you know, I think about any of the service techs we may have out there, right? So if you're working on typical HVAC equipment, they're cleaning those coils anyway, something you do. And it's just, I think you're, sometimes you got certain areas where some of the, you know, when the trees are blooming and stuff, those coils get a little bit dirtier and sometimes, probably that same, right. same situation where you may have to clean the coil, you know, at some locations more than others. Yeah, and I guess the other thing you got to be sure to consider, um, is that airflow you know wherever they're located in that parking garage they've got to have enough airflow traveling through there so that the heat pumps aren't you know they're star starving for the air that they need uh, and if that's you know if they don't have adequate airflow then you got to start looking at ducting and and you may be bringing that cold air uh, in through your ducting and, and at that point it may make sense just to to put the heat pumps outdoors and, and consider that a, a backup electric all right, we're going to go to uh, next slide. Okay, this is uh, this is what that system would look like with that backup electric tank. So here we've got the heat pump. Um, you, you, this could be multiple heat pumps, like we saw in the the previous piping diagram, uh, piped into your thermal storage, and then you've also got uh, your your cold water line coming to an electric backup tank. 
uh, so that when it's needed, that tank could actually supply the entire load for the building. Um, and then in addition, you'll see that the storage tanks that are paired with the heat pump also go through that uh, backup tank as well. So you can get a, you know, if you drops off and you're kind of on that um, edge of being able to provide the set point that you need out of the heat pump, um, that backup could do a little boost as well. Yeah, I think that's, you know, this concept, I I like Jennifer, because what we've noticed is a lot of times when people are designing these, they're not even really talking about backup or redundancy. Right. You know, and I think a lot of that goes back to like, they're, well, you know, the upfront cost is a little bit more, so they really don't have that budget to put in the redundancy. So it's just something that, you know, I think as an industry, we should probably still think about. We're, we're not designing gas systems without without any kind of redundancy, but it seems like Right now, people are willing to design these these heat pump systems without any backup or redundancy. Right. Yep. All right. So we're back to the retrofits. Um, so I guess just kind of is amazing to me. I'll get some requests. We'll get some requests here. They'll say, hey, we're looking to, um, you know, evaluate some heat pump water heaters we've got existing good equipment you know it's a couple years old high efficiency and you know they want to replace the high efficiency but you know we have to have conversations like you know is the high efficiency is that a no do we have to remove that can we keep it you know i hate to throw away good money or hate to throw anybody's good money away right if it's a brand new uh, equipment a couple years old performing well but they want to start to evaluate you know trying to reduce their carbon footprint maybe they have some mandates they got to start looking at so you know that's that's always going to be you know with the retrofit is you know can that existing equipment stay for backup again especially if it's new let's you know we just need to evaluate that every situation is going to be a little bit different but we could we could easily tie an existing uh, gas system to the, to the heat pump system uh, so really nothing's going to change on the retrofit uh, from the as from the previous system um, again, we're just going to have to evaluate all the same things we did as far as, you know, storage um, room, as much room we got for all the storage we need. Uh, again, the electrical capacity is going to come up. That's going to be, as everybody's going through these design concepts, I mean, it sounds repetitive, but that's going to be the number one thing. One of the things you're going to have to look at is, do I have that electrical load? Again, we're, we're talking about going from systems that ran off 115 volts, less than 15 amps to, you know, really requiring a lot of uh, amps and, and electrical capacity. Um, so I, again, nothing's really going to change. It's just, you know, you're, you're going to probably, as you start to get some requests from uh, building owners out there um, or anybody looking to, you know, apply this technology, but just, just going to have to be very flexible and ask a lot of questions, you know, try to see, hey, you know, is that backup? It's probably nothing even wrong with you know, if it's an older system, if you can keep that gas appliance in there just to have that backup and then evaluate you know when that fails or you know time that it needs to be replaced what that backup ends up being if it, then you go to an electric water heater if you can uh because you know there's certain parts you know you're a lot more involved in this than i am jennifer but you know there's certain parts of the country that are saying okay well if you have the heat pump system you know you can't have electrical backup or it's got to be you got to have so much heat pump capacity before you can even consider using any kind of electric resistance which even again that's going to kind of burden that you know electrical system in the building that's right. Yeah. Um, you know, I like the point that you bring up about, um, you know, maintaining that that gas system that's already there as the backup. Um, you know, if the goal for the project is is you know carbon reduction, and you're only using that backup, let's say three months of the year, and your heat pumps are running the rest of the year, I mean, you, you've just reduced that you, your your uh, carbon emissions by 75 percent. So that's still a a really huge impact. And like you said, if you've got a high efficiency um, gas product in place already, uh, you know, there, there's there's obviously a trade-off that's going to be evaluated there. But um, yeah, I just want to point out that's still a, a really big reduction in carbon yeah, emission. I don't think people think, I don't think a lot of people think that way, right? When they're talking carbon reduction, I don't think they think that, okay, we're going from an 80% to a 95%. They don't think of that being carbon reduction, yeah, but it is. Yeah, sure. That's yeah, huge. And then you add, you know, you add a heat pump and it can cover the load for, or like I said, nine months out of the year, and, and you've, you've made a really big impact. Yeah, excellent. So, you turn on. so this would just kind of be how we would 
uh, incorporate that. It's almost replacing that uh, diagram that uh, we showed previously when Jennifer was talking where we had that electrical uh, water heat in, heater in there. Now you can see that we've got that back gas back up uh, in that storage tank. So this again, this this is a you know good for retrofit, but you know this this concept could maybe even work for like say if you're looking to lower your carbon footprint for a building, um, but then maybe the budget comes in a little bit higher for doing all heat pumps, you know, or all electrical. So we, we can say, okay, let's do a mix. We're still gonna, like we just said, we're still gonna lower our carbon footprint and because that gas isn't gonna run much, much, right? Just a few time, few months out of the year, depending on the, the condition we're in. But this, this has really been, you know, a topic that we've talked about a lot for places that are still allowed to burn gas as kind of hybrid solution, like an entry level, uh, you know, into reducing the carbon footprint for, for that building or for that organization. Yeah, and the other great thing about whether it's gas or electric is backup, um, is that ability to, to boost your water temperature if you need to. So, um, you know, as the ambient temperature drops off, uh, so will the heat pump's ability to produce the hottest uh, water temperature. So if you get into a situation where you're kind of on that edge of where uh, the heat pump and the ambient temperature um, are at a point where you're, you're not quite getting uh, your, your outlet water temperature, then it, yeah, a simple system like this could allow you to boost that temperature and really optimize the way the system runs. So Dan, one of the questions that we had um, before the webinar too was kind of relating the difference, the main difference between heat pumps and condensing units. Are there any other things that you look at here when you uh, consider you know, A versus B with this type of project? Well, yeah, I mean, if you just look at like, like a condensing, you know, water heater, you know, if we talk in terms of efficiency, it, it's, you know, 90, 97%, you know, some of them are 98. Um, you know, that means, you know, we're, we're pretty efficient you know, getting, if we're spending a dollar, getting 98 cents out of that for gas. So that's, you, you know, as far as use is energy. So that's, that, that's pretty good. Uh, now the heat pumps are rated a little bit different. You know, they're rated in COP. Um, so, so that stands for coefficient of performance. And, and really what they're, they're looking at is it's a large math calculation. I, I'm not an engineer. Jennifer's an engineer. She could probably do the math, but just in simple terms, you know, you're taking, you're using one, you're consuming one unit of energy and, and then you're outputting, you know, four, four and a half, whatever that COP is. So basic terminology, instead of being that 97%, you're, you're 400%, 300% efficient, depending if the COP is three or four. Uh, the thing with COP is, right, there's there's going to be operating conditions at that and, and you got to look and typically those are going to be an elevated ambient. So if you look at maybe if I've got a job in Hawaii, maybe I'm running at 70 majority of the time, but most of the places around you know the US, we're not gonna be operating at 70, so our COP is gonna be lower. So when you look at those, those are just things as far as the major difference in them. Obviously the technology is way different because we're not burning gas with the heat pump, but, but that's gonna be the main thing is when you look at those, if you're looking at an efficiency, that's the difference in efficiency, you know, technology, you know, it's completely different as far as, you know, you're burning the gas, transferring the energy through that heat exchanger into the water. Uh, with the heat pump, we're absorbing that energy from the ambient air, or, or if it's a water source, you know, that, that water, and then rejecting it into the refrigerant, and then transferring that back into the, to the domestic water. So, um, you know, if you're going to sit there and try to do, you know, like in, in a complete evaluation of energy usage and in system efficiency, I mean, you got to really know what your, all your operating temperatures are and, and your, um, you know, just, just the characteristics of, of the building and, and the, and the ambient conditions. And that's something that, you know, holds true for both uh, the, the gas condensing and the heat pump technology that if somebody's going to buy a condensing boiler and not use an outdoor sensor and just do 180 degree set point, uh, you know, all year long, you're not going to get the numbers that are stamped on the AFUE sticker out of that piece of equipment either. So I no. think it's uh, you know you have to to look at it at an individual case by case basis and really set the equipment up for success in that way. Yeah, no, we get we we get those calls. Unfortunately, we get those calls that hey, my my high efficiency products not not condensing, and this is just like you said, it's they're, they're bringing back 150, 160 to it, and then it's it's not designed to, to condense at those temperatures. Yeah. 
Okay, let me go to, I think we've got another balancing slide here. So another uh, tool to have kind of in your toolbox for these systems, it's let's say you have a retrofit uh, and you know that the building has changed many, many times <laughs> over the course of the years, there are no as built, uh, but you've now inherited this project and you need to balance it correctly on the research line. Uh, a great uh, valve to use would be this quick setter plus. So this is a low lead valve that's a static balancing valve, but it has a built in flow meter. So you can, we've got all sorts of different tail pieces. You could just press this into an existing system for your different risers and then pull the, the little pin there in the, the picture. It's gonna bypass water through the flow gauge and you can see what's actually happening. Uh, this can be a great way to get a baseline for you know, where is the water going in this building and then you can start making your adjustments based on, on that because uh, it's with the thermosetter, it's going to do the same thing kind of dynamically based on temperature. This will give you a, a window into each one of those pipes to see where is the water going? You know, should it be going there? Do, are we out of balance here? And can really help you get a better understanding if you're over circulating or uh, that type of thing. This one, since it's for DHW, also has a temperature gauge built right into. So you can see how that, you know, how uh, one GPM affects the temperature in that, that riser at different points throughout the uh, the project and then also if you're an engineer and you want to come in and uh, in a commissioning step you can do that without having to get a, a balancing contractor to walk you around the building to to see where water is going so just another another thing to have available for those types of projects okay so we've had a bunch of questions come in but one of the things that I wanted to kind of ask the audience to just an open-ended question so if you have installed or designed or whatever your role in the industry, uh, maybe if you've sold one of these heat pump water heater systems, what are some of the, the lessons that you've learned? What are some things that you would uh, do the same way in the future or do differently uh, in the future? I'll kind of keep an eye on those as they come in. We've got a bunch of questions that are that are coming through um, that we can start to go through as well now. So um, I would say as people are typing their answers, uh, one of the main kind of clumps of questions relates to sizing. So how are we gonna size the swing tank, the amount of storage that we need, how are we gonna maximize that COP? So where do you, and this is I'm sure a very, very difficult question and requires a lot of engineering work on the background, but where do you start with this for, for sizing? What are some of your limiting factors, uh, Jen and, uh, and Dan? So yeah, I mean, so first of all, I mean, the, the sizing, depending, the, there's a bunch of different options. Pretty much all the manufacturers out there that that are providing products will have will have a sizing program. Um, there's some third-party sizing programs out there also. Uh, you know, unfortunately, I think we're all kind of doing it a little bit different right now. Um, so you'll probably, if somebody does one and, and takes what what's required, they're probably going to get a little bit different. Uh, output from each program. Um, but really, you know, the main things you need to know, you know, and again, some are gonna be set up a little bit different, but if it's like multifamily, um, you know, if you can just, if you get the number of rooms, uh, kind of like what we propose there in, in some of our sizing examples, we have the breakdown for bedrooms. Uh, you can typically do that in most everybody's sizing program with just that. Uh, and then it'll kind of obviously want your, location or your, or your ambient conditions because again we kind of showed through the presentation that's really a driver on how we're going to size these uh, and if it's not uh, not multifamily you're really going to need to know what the um, you know we'll say the the max demand is as far as for the peak load uh, the peak load time and, and then the off peak time and the off peak load will be some numbers you'll need to know um, and then you'll have to know too is do I that that storage space right? Because if if I don't have a lot of room for storage and I'm limited, say on a thousand gallons, well that's going to drive how many more heat pumps. So it, the, the sizing systems will kind of manipulate that for you and tell you, okay, well if I had that for our example, if I had 2,300 gallons of storage, well then I can get away with four heat pumps. But if we went to where we only had a thousand gallons of storage, now we're going to drive that heat pump probably up to six seven. And then at that point, you know, that's when you're going to have to start evaluating that that upfront cost because that's really going to change with the more heat pumps you get. But yeah, I mean, yeah, like I said, if you, every, 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 there's there, there's multiple sizing programs out there. It, they're all pretty much going to need the same information, but it's really going to depend if it's if it's multifamily or some other kind of application. 
Yeah, the, the great thing about the multifamily applications is is we it's it's a well known load profile, and so the, um, the better known the load profile, the better that your sizing results will be. Yeah, those are all great points, and I think that we you know we look around at at sizing uh, calculation methods for mixing valves too, because we're we're kind of in the same boat in that that we want to make sure that whatever uh, we're sizing the building for, we've selected the appropriate mixing valve. Uh, and there are a lot of factors. And I would say that every calculator that we've ever looked at has given us a different answer. <laughs> so I think it's <laughs> uh, worth asking some you know, follow-up questions. And like you said, what is, you know, do, how much storage space do we have? Is that something that we're going to run out of? Do we need to work around that? Or, you know, what is the, what is the limiting piece of it? And then really, I think having a conversation like this with whichever uh, equipment you're going with, is going to be key. So why don't I read some of the, the tips that came in? So there's a, a good one right off the, the bat. Ignore rules of thumb. Um, do proper design and don't oversize. Uh, that's a that's a great one for anything, I'm sure, but especially as we're um, looking at a different technology potentially. Uh, get all the job site facts that you can. What is the unit location? Noise considerations. You know, I think that your example of the uh, the parking garage sounds, you know, like it makes a lot of sense to me that it's already a noisy place that's close enough to the building, but you're not uh, using a, a an apartment that you could rent to somebody for the mechanical room. So uh, that seems like it could be a, a really nice fit for a lot of projects. Um, and let's see, are these systems well suited for 140 running in the research? So that, from a mixing valve standpoint, um, we probably don't want to research 140 24 7. Um, if that is the case, then it seems like your electric uh, or gas swing tank might be required to do that or uh, thermal disinfection. If we were going to try and do thermal disinfection and circulate 160 degree water for you know 10 minutes on Christmas Eve, we're probably going to need something to help us out to do that if we're in you know, Boston, as an example. So, but um, I would say to that, uh, 140 all the time maybe is overkill. So it depends on the, the project. Is what are you guys finding in in those types of cases? Yeah, I mean, I, I would I, I would agree with you. I mean, the you know, the, the research design. I mean, right to be honest with you, Max. Right now, with with just kind of the you know everybody trying to get the heat pump layout and try to understand that i mean you know we're just now starting to get into talking about the research line and all and all that i mean it's it's been a undertaking for us as an organization just on the education to to get everybody kind of up to this new technology how it's how's it piped um so, so you know ah, to hopefully have more of an answer for you you know in six months to nine months if we talk again right now we're just again we're, we're trying to it's almost taken sections of this these applications at a time to educate everybody on yeah and that i mean that's something that on the the Kalefi end we see a lot of because i think that maybe in the past um if you just had a bunch of redundant gas-fired water heaters in the mechanical room you may have had a really wasteful research system you were just able to mask that because you were you know, basically keeping one of those those gas heaters on a lot or you're know, running a lot of cycles just to keep up with the heat loss of the research line. And we definitely don't want to do that because that's just heating water for, for nothing to just dissipate into the building. And in some cases, then you're, uh, it's affecting your cooling load and <laughs> you're just dissipating 140 degree water into the building all day. Uh, you're going to have to air condition that back down to a comfortable uh, ambient. So those are things that, uh, that we notice um, ideally for research. Um, you know, if anybody on the call can find a piping material that loves 140 degree or hotter uh, chlorinated fresh water, let me know because the copper development handbook says if you're going to be warmer than that, you want to stay at the two to three feet per second mark for copper. So, uh, you know, run that through your calculations and see how that affects your copper sizing. It's, it really increases the, the size of the pipe because we're worried about velocity and, and pinholing and, and scaling of all the components if you're running warmer. So uh, like I said before, no bonus points for researching uh, hot all the time. If, uh, if the occupants don't even notice, you know, they're not, they're not benefiting from water that's being wasted in the building because it's too hot. Um, 
And let's see what are some other. Hey, hey, Max. Yeah. You had made a comment about somebody had made a comment about not oversize, and I think that's that's really that's key because yeah. these units, these systems have a pretty like again pretty higher upfront cost than a gas system. So there's a, I'll say a little bit of maybe sticker shock maybe when that cost is presented to the owner or the decision maker. Um, so again, any amount that we upsize is actually going to add to kind of that upfront cost. Um, so we really want to make sure that it is, you know, sized. And that goes back to what I was saying. Nobody's adding really like any backup. It's again to that upfront cost. So right. I think that's critical to really try to size that and, and not oversize it, but give yourself, because none of us want that call. The, the installing contractor doesn't want to call. The design engineer doesn't want to call. The manufacturer doesn't want the call of no hot water, right? That's That's that call that everybody in this, you know, chain of supplying the product and the hot water, nobody wants that call. But so yeah. it's, it's tricky. It's a tricky situation. That one is. Yeah. And I think that's part of why the, the learning curve is, is a little bit bigger here, because those those gas systems were able to mask some of the inefficiencies in the research. And it, uh, you know, that just the cost point allowed you to oversize just to be just to be sure. Right. Um, and now you've got to take a step back and really take a hard look at those things and make sure that you're designing the most efficient system possible. And you guys had a great point earlier um, and kind of covered it with a bunch of different slides. But if we like take a step back, what is the goal here? Are we in Berkeley, California, and this is a new building and they will not be running natural gas to this site. So we're going, you know, zero carbon. We have to make it work with heat pumps and you know electric backup only. Is that the criteria or is it probably the other, I don't know, 99, 95% of the, you know, the, areas of the world right now or of the the US and Canada where really a, a lower you know lowering your bills with some redundancy maybe keeping the gas appliances around until they're at the end of their uh, lives of their you know service lives and then we can do more of a slow transition if that's the goal and i think that you know what you're describing with the different slides are you know if if you don't care and you're not forced to then maybe gas is just what you're doing right now if you want to lower the bills and, and really set up a system to have a c uh, a really high cop for certain parts of the year and then just have that electric or gas to make sure that it's not affecting uh the hot water delivery for a hotel one uh you know it's a really high occupancy and it's cold outside or something like that it, it's everything in between and i think that that is why we wanted to have you guys on today is to start this conversation to at least have some questions to ask uh, to figure out what the the concept is for the project because it's it's definitely not all zero carbon now it may be in bigger cities moving forward it seems like you know the new york cities and uh, and I think Washington State was a recent one or are moving in that direction. But realistically, uh, we don't want to just throw out all the, the gas appliances tomorrow and switch to electric because we, we wouldn't be able to realistically do it anyway. It's going to be, uh, you know, on-ramp, off-ramp type thing. Uh, but I think that these are the exact questions that we want to ask. Uh, what are some other, you know, I guess project goals that you think of when you talk to, to customers about these types of systems? Uh, you know, so it's again, so kind of when that's one thing we kind of walk through is when it's what, what are we trying to accomplish? You know, what's your customer looking for? Are they looking to reduce that carbon footprint? Um, you know, is, is no gas? Is it, can they even use gas? I mean, I think those are those are some of the, the major goals. I'll tell you just as far as common. Some, some common things we hear as we go through the sizing process, and I think everybody's going to experience this, right? It's like, uh, well, Dan, I, you, you know that's a lot of storage, don't have that much storage, right? And then it's like, okay, so then we kind of go with less storage, more heat pump, then they're like, well, that's a pretty upfront cost. And then we get farther down the line, they're like, well, I don't have that much electrical infrastructure. It's kind of like all the things we talked about. I mean, the goals, there's not not a lot of goals, but it's just kind of like, as we're working through some of the things we're seeing as far as how to try to apply it. And, and it seems like we start at one point with, well, we want to try to do X amount of storage, but then as a job, gets to the finish line, we kind of sized it different to really fit that location. So like each job seems to be really custom. Yeah. If it's nothing, there's like not like one or two designs, like a heat pump capacity in a tank that we can apply everywhere. It's it's just really custom design and layout for each job. Yeah. And if this presentation that we just we did project A and project B, right? And and there are two different locations. If we were presenting on uh 
high efficiency gas water heaters, it would have been the same system because it was the same building, right? It wouldn't it wouldn't matter whether it was on one side of the country or the other. And now we start talking about uh, heat pump systems. There's there's a lot of trade offs um, in each system, depending on the geography, you know, where you are in the country and what your um, climate is 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 going to be unique. And then one of the um, the other things that was mentioned in the chat is kind of the how do we get a baseline of what's happening now and we had a coffee with Kalefi last year practically perfect uh plumbing with gary klein pete skinner and they actually set up some some uh, temperature meters and some flow meters in existing systems and got a baseline for a month or something like that to see okay whatever happened in the past whatever this building was sized for if it was oversized or undersized how much water are we using in the course of a month and with that they they got some tangible you know retrofit information that they could use to resize and then you know the focus of that webinar they went with smaller uh, pipes for the next phase of that project that was kind of a, a cookie cutter of the same building because they proved that we, we just don't use that much water whatever it was sized for we're able to save some money there so that all works backwards to maybe we only need one of those heat pumps with gas backup to start with and and we can go from there so i think that uh, one way to get something tangible to start with is to in a retrofit see what is happening now <laughs> and that's something that with those uh, quick setters you could pull the pin and see you know, how much water is actually leaving this mechanical room right now you know is this what we thought it would be and then with btu or uh, you know temperature meters and, and flow meters we can see uh, what is the delta T? Are we, you know, would we be served to insulate these pipes before we change anything and see how that changes it? Those are some things that I think are good starting points if you have the, the time and the flexibility to get that sizing more accurate. Yeah, no, I think I think that's a great point, Max, and uh, we're certainly doing that. We're taking an opportunity to to learn more about different applications and mapping these load profiles. Uh, because all of that uh, influences our sizing and so we, we've got to continue to get better and better at that uh, for all the points that we've we've previously mentioned as we make this transition to this new technology for for water heating we've uh, we've got to be a little more accurate and um, and make sure that you know it's not oversized as as it may have been in the past um, and, and i guess one one other i guess bonus i'll say to these oversized systems uh, that you may find in retrofit applications is you know, back to that demand response point. Um, you know, you, you may put some smaller heat pumps in because you, you realize that system's oversized, but now you've got a really big uh, battery that you can charge up and you can um, um, help offload some of that uh, peak demand on the grid. And um, I think in the future, we'll, we'll probably see a lot of those um, efforts by customers uh, be incentivized by the utilities. Yeah, and that's a great point. And as you mentioned, that's a, a whole nother webinar um, to yeah. go into the thousand wise. But the the thing that I'd like to say is that we know how to do all this. It just would affect when we're actually loading up those tanks. Right. Yep. So let me um, let me run through the last couple slides here, and then we'll look over the last uh, questions that came in. Cody, if you see anything else that stands out here, I'll just kind of mention the last. Uh, slide since we're at the top of the hour. So if you have any questions about this, the you know all four of the guys on the the screen here answer these questions about research all day, and we can help figure out uh, if we're doing that well once it leaves the mechanical room. So uh, you get a, a live person when you call the the tech support to go through those details, and then also some kind of ripped from the headlines. Uh, projects, Greg and Dan have a podcast where they'll go through and say, hey, we got a call about a mixing valve that was doing X, Y, and Z, and here are some you know, troubleshooting steps, and here's how you move forward. And another good one that there's a specific episode of this that Cody did that's uh, about research creep. That's just a five-minute version of that mixing valve slide that I showed, so I would point you in that direction if you're looking for uh, a quick, uh, concise, better uh, worded version than, than what I did of uh, research creep that goes into more detail. And then yeah, follow us on social media and Lock and Bar as well. They always have great content on their platforms. Um, so that takes us to the end. Uh, Cody, did you see anything come through the, the Q&A that would be good to ask while we've got the group here too? It looks like there are a lot of questions that might be more project specific that uh, between the, the four of us we can follow up with afterwards as well. Oh, are you there, Cody? Oh, 
Okay, we may, it doesn't look like his uh, audio is coming through here. So um, any other comments that, that you guys have, uh, Jennifer and Dan, uh, before we sign off here? I just, I'd like to say thanks, Max, for having us. And hopefully we can meet up again before AHR next year and talk a little bit. Yeah, yeah I, I appreciate the opportunity. And, um, you know, we'd, we'd love to to continue working with you. If this was helpful for, for the audience, then um, we can continue this topic. And I'm sure there's plenty more webinars we could create on uh, heat pump systems. Yeah, based on the response that we had to this this webinar, uh, I think that we're going to need to come back to this topic sooner than later because it, it was uh, uh, we had really big registration numbers, and I think that it just shows that this is a conversation that a lot of people are having right now. So yeah, thank you again. Uh, we appreciate your expertise uh, in the mechanical room, and then we're happy to help uh, you know as it spins through the building too to make sure that we're not uh, firing your <laughs> appliances more than they need to be to keep everybody happy. All right. Thanks, Max. All right. Thanks, everybody.